for the Navigating HTAC webinar series. Uh, so my name is Nolana Neubauer and I am one of the co-vice presidents with the HQPAC. And we're being joined today um, by you, Karenette, um, with their presentation title being Transforming the Home Care Marketplace. Hi, everybody. Thank you for joining us today. We're quite excited about this opportunity, myself and Dr. Chasen. Great. Next slide, Shabnam. All right, so just to give you all an overview of AgeWell, I'm sure all of you know what AgeWell is, but we always like to do this in case we have some newcomers. Um, so AgeWell is an incredible network of centers of excellence um, where their vision is to focus on becoming Canada's leadership in technology and aging and really focusing on different benefits from around the world. And the mission of AgeWell is to be able to develop a community of researchers, older adults, caregivers, partners, and future leaders that accelerates the delivery of technology-based solutions that make meaningful difference in the lives of Canadians. And what's not included on here um, is we also like to think of our wonderful clinicians that's really become one of the uh, inspirations for trying to um, focus on this webinar series, bringing in different clinicians and other individuals to get the chance to learn more about some of these amazing startup companies. So our success story with AgeWell, so AgeWell started up um, in 2015, so they've been around for the last five and a half years, and they have grown into incredible numbers, at least since I started. I started around the same time. Um, so to date, AgeWell has 755 highly qualified personnel or grad students, undergrads, postdocs. They have more than 250 researchers. They, and we see on the cross out here, it used to be 25 startups, but now AgeWell has helped to support 40 startups, which is amazing with how, the short time that AgeWell has been around. Um, AgeWell now has three national innovation hubs, 43 universities and colleges across eight provinces, 126 projects, and 4,700 plus engaged older adults and caregivers. So it's absolutely amazing with the network that's been established. And so OTAC is a newer group um, that is partnering with this webinar series. Um, I am one of the co-founders um, of OTAC Canada, which really focuses on just trying to bring in the voice and bringing in different clinicians from occupational therapists through to nurses, physical therapists, and just giving them that opportunity to be able to learn more about startup companies and how they can get involved. What we have learned over the last couple of years is there have been silos and with, by partnering with AgeWell, we're hoping to be able to help reduce the silo and give more opportunities for us to have a conversation. So now I'm just gonna read off the bios of our incredible presenters. I know we're all super excited to hear about them. Um, so I'm honored to be able to welcome Nectari um, Charitakis. So he is the co-founder of uh, and CEO of UCareNet. He has over six, 25 years of experience in enterprise IT sales and marketing, 15 years gained through international leadership roles in Canada, the US, and Europe, working for companies such as AT&T Capital, Xerox, and the Hewlett Packard. He is also best known for building new teams, bridging emerging solutions to market, and new revenue generation. So Nectari's personal experience with the care of his aging parents is what inspired him to create UCareNet's suite of tools for both caregivers and care seekers. And I think like many of us that have joined in the call, many of us have been brought forward in this area because of our love and for those that we've had to care for that are older adults. I'm also honored to welcome Dr. Martin Chasen. Um, he is currently the medical director of palliative care at William Osler Health System in Brampton, Ontario. He was previously the medical director, palliative care at the Ottawa Hospital Cancer Center and the palliative rehabilitation program at the Elizabeth Breer Ottawa. He currently holds professorship at the universities of Toronto, McMaster, Ottawa and McGill and has lectured internationally and nationally, including at an invitation to speak on palliative care and the House of Commons for Canada's parliament. So absolutely incredible. So I'm gonna stop it here and I'm gonna pass it off to our speakers. Perfect, thank you so much. So I will share my screen and we can start into our presentation. So today it's all about uh, what we're doing as a company, UCARNET, and also what we're doing with Dr. Chasen and William Osler with regards to enabling e-health solutions to improve uh, home and community care. So I'll, we heard about our, our bio, so I'll just skip forward. 
I spent a lot of time in assistive and long-term care and it really gave me an opportunity to, I guess I don't want to use the word test, but it is really test, see what other families were encountering. And I took that as main impetus. So when we started UCareNet, we went out and we interviewed a lot of families. And what we basically heard were a couple of key messages. One is the lack of consistency. Families had a really big deal and uh, problem dealing with different caregivers coming into the house at different hours. And it really established a bit of a disruption into the routine of their family member. The other big issue that they had was everything seemed to be under a time clock. Many times caregivers would show up for 45 minute shifts or an hour shift. They would have to get somebody dressed, fed for the day. They would run out and somebody else would run in at night. So the, you know, the rapid time and the lack of consistency caused a lot of issues. The other thing that I found very interesting, and this is a problem that I encounter a lot, it's something referred to as the black hole or lack of information. Quite frankly, you really don't know who shows up, what time they showed up, what they did that day. But more importantly, mm -hmm. we never had an idea as to what the physical and emotional condition was of the uh, person that we are caring for. What, and like all of us, we live very busy lives, right? We have our own families that we need to deal with. And ultimately, all we want to be able to do is actually get our hands on information so we can make the right decisions and know if something's going wrong or if everything is right on demand, right? When it suits us, whether at work, whether at play or whether at home. The other thing that I found very interesting is vulnerable people refuse to have to get help. And I understand that. Is, you know, they're afraid to show a sign of uh, lack of independence, but more importantly, they're afraid of getting institutionalized. And at the end of the day, no matter what age you are, the most important thing is everybody wants to be able to remain at home. So this was the key impetus that we took. And then all of a sudden, as we all know, the pandemic hit last year and it just caused a lot of additional chaos. But I think what it magnified for everybody is one, COVID-19 made loneliness, and isolation much harder, not only for seniors, but also for all vulnerable people. And for uh, those of us that live through the system, all it really helped to do was reconfirm that the system is broken, it's not working properly. There's no news there. Anybody who's following the media in the last 10 years knows that that is a major issue. I often get the question why I started this. And primarily, um, the main reason is I want to help other families not encounter the same problems that myself and my family did. Even though my parents were entrenched in the Greek community, my mom being the president of the Women's Auxiliary for about 15 years, even though we had people refer to us within you know, two degrees of separation, my parents ended up getting robbed twice. One from a caregiver that stole her checks and forged eight to $900 checks from my dad because putting it into an ATM, anything under a thousand bucks doesn't need a, a signature verification. Dad though was very sharp. At the end of the month, he picked that up and sure enough, um, he was able to claim back the money and that was okay. The second one was a, another beautiful caregiver that told my dad, I'm going to New York for the weekend. Can you lend me some money? I'll give it back to you on Monday. And then lo and behold, she flew off to Greece. We never seen her again. So part of the reason why I did it is to make sure that other families don't have to go through the, the problems that we did. The other question I, I get is what's different from you? What's different about us is that we're very much on, on focus on making a social and a health impact. A lot of what we do, we do for free. We bring tools and resources to families to be able to have an impact on Canada, to have an impact on society. And we're very much focused on being a value-based uh, social enterprise. The other thing is data. Data insights is the most important thing, whether it's uh, shift reports that we'll talk about later or having analytics and, and wellness summaries that you could monitor your family member uh, is another. The other thing is we're a technology company. That's the most important thing. We are technology driven in everything that we do. And then finally, and I think this is very important, we're open system. The data, the application belongs to the family. Whether or not you use a booking platform to find a care provider or not, you could use the application and hire somebody through an agency, get somebody through a LIN, or even find the person next door, but you can still use the app to help manage your environment. And finally, the value that we look to provide is to provide tools in the hands of families and clinicians so that could customize and remotely manage a care plan to the family's needs. So that's the story about what we do. We have three great products within our, our realm. We have, a, uh, we have an, an awesome home care management platform in your pocket. We have a universal, we have a very cool universal translator that makes communication simpler, smarter, 
and uh, faster. And the other thing, along with Dr. Chasen, we have an amazing and award-winning virtual care package for palliative care. And those are the three things that we'll be focusing on. With this vision in mind, we started two years ago to be able As to develop As a caregiver, this. you can develop your career, establish your own clients, and maximize your earning potential. How? Create your profile, post your qualifications, share a video discussing your experience, display your ratings and recommendations, search job opportunities, and get hired. So let's, do, let's drill down and see what exactly that means. So from a care management perspective, we have three key components. We have a component that helps people hire care. We have our home management app that helps them manage care, but we also have the opportunity to share care throughout the circle of, uh, of care. Our home care booking platform is all about facilitating and making it easier to find people. What I think is fairly unique is the way that we go about matching families and the person they need care for with care providers. We focus on a couple of things and we make it very easy, very visually for people to follow. But I think over and above the skills that you're looking for, the time, the costing that you're looking for, we're really focused on getting a much better fit between the family member and the person providing care for them. So we also focus on what their interests are and what their languages are that they speak. So the more commonality, the more affinity you have within culture and with language, the better opportunity for there to be a fit and a better opportunity for the person at home to be comfortable. The second thing is once you find, the per once you find your, uh, your care providers, you could actually do a search or algorithm will match you. You can look at their profiles. You can maintain your safety and your anonymity by messaging them through the platform. And only when you're comfortable to actually have a video call with them or meet them outside of the home, can you go about doing that? And the third component is once you find the person that you want to hire, you can send them a job offer. And if they accept it, you can start your scheduling and you can go forward. The other very critical point, and this is where I think is even the, the most important thing is our remote management platform. One of the issues I mentioned earlier is that black hole where people don't know what's going on in the home. And the way we set it up is you get a notification when your care provider shows up. So now you know it's two o'clock and in this case, uh, Teresa has shown up. In order for her to close her shift and leave, at the end of shift, she has to send you a, a shift summary. And it's a very simple thing to do through the phone to just touch a couple of buttons, but at least this way you'll know what they did that day, what activities took place, and also the time that they, they left so that you could clock out and then you could pay them. The other important thing is we provide analytics through what we refer to as our wellness meter. So you'll notice there's five components in the bottom and it's all touch screen and we use emojis for everything. So what is the emotional physiological condition of the parent that day? Are they happy? Are they sad? Or are they in a lot of pain? What is their hydration, their mobility, their hygiene and also their continence? And what we do is we take trend lines and we actually send you reports. So if their mobility has been down, then maybe you should give them a little bit more exercise. More importantly though, if their hydration is trending downwards, that's something you really have to be careful for. I almost lost my mom to dehydration. So I know this is a very, very sensitive issue. Same thing with their incontinent. The more days that they're incontinent, then the chances are they're gonna have more and more pain. And the other thing that we built into it is medication, uh, medication list and reminders. So whether mom's at home by herself and she's capable of using the app, you can send her reminders or to the care provider. And the other nice thing is the next time you pop into the hospital, you go to your doctors and they ask you what medication the person is taking. You just open up your phone and you have your medication list there. The other important thing that we heard is we all get these phone calls. Oh, there's a doctor's meeting at, you know, March 19th at the following year, there's one in November, we take a little scribble note and then we forget about it. So what we built in was a sh uh, calendar that could be shared with everybody within the family and the extended circle of care. You also have the capability that if your care provider goes to a shift and takes the parent to a doctor's appointment, in order to close out of that shift, they have to update the calendar. So this way there's no missing activities. The shift reports as well and the wellness meter could be shared with everybody. And the other thing that we heard from families is it would be nice if we could split the costing. So here you could actually receive your invoice and split it between the different members of your family. So where are we today? We have over 5,500 care providers signed up in Ontario and British Columbia with an average salary starting about $20 an hour. We're launching on March 15 our new site 
And by June, we will be rolling out across Canada, which we're very happy about. The best thing is our, pl our booking platform is 100% free. And this is part of what we're trying to do back to, uh, to help Canadians and, and really have a social impact. So we don't charge families anything for registering and searching. We don't charge care providers, nor do we uplift their fee. Whatever they charge the families, exactly what the family would end up paying for. And where we look to make money is in the higher value, which is our management app, completely optional. And as I said, for $15 a month, a family could use the app, whether they hire through us or any other agency or whether they find care from their neighbor next door. And the most important thing is we're 100% open system. So the data is yours. Anytime you want, you can download your data and you continue with any other environment. You don't have to worry about losing access to any of the information you have. So here you can have a historical record that provides you all the details you want. The other cool app that we have is uh, UCare Lingo. I made this through, through my experience of dealing with mom and her dementia. What I found is even though she was very good, her English was quite fluent. She had a good understanding of French. As her dementia progressed, she started losing it. So when we moved from assisted to long-term care, I did what a lot of people do. I had all these little stickies on the wall that were translating Greek into phonetic English. And from there, I actually progressed and developed this poster, which is available for download through our website. What I found is by adding a persona to the person that was lying in bed, all of a sudden the nurse or the clinician that was coming in was able to say, oh, this is Bula, she was a teacher, she's Greek. These are the things that distressed her. So we know that people with uh, cognitive issues many times get agitated because they don't know what's going on. So just simply having that above my mom's bed that said, if, you know, if I am agitated, just telling me that I'm pretty made her smile or a little caress to her hand would just make her smile. And then what we did is we had all these activities of daily living, we grouped them in pronouns, actions, activities, and things. So this way we're able, the, the provider coming into the uh, room or the clinician was able to easily or more easily translate to them. We've got a lot of requests to make these into cue cards as big posters. So what we actually did is we took it one step further and we developed a mobile app, which as I said earlier, it's about making communication, especially multilingual communication, faster, simpler, and smarter. And it focuses on three things. One is to remove language barriers. The other thing is to build bonds among people to help break down the isolation. And I think the most important thing is uh, communicating effectively. It's very important for clinicians to be able to explain to the patient exactly what the situation is and what they're, what they're suggesting. But more importantly, it's a, it's a great opportunity for the patient in the own language to be able to communicate back to their clinician and letting them know how they're feeling and whether or not they understand what's going on. So when it comes down to it, we translate it into seven, 17 different languages. The whole idea about you care lingo is to eliminate all those blank stares where people don't understand. I'm going to play a little short video and then I'm going to do a demo. As the COVID-19 pandemic continues to grip our communities, lockdown restrictions and social distancing requirements can severely limit access to patients who depend on others for care. UCare Lingo offers healthcare professionals easy to use digital tools to translate important information for patients and better understand their needs. With clear visual cues, UCare Lingo translates 35 commonly used words and phrases related to care, wellness, and active daily living. Patients can now communicate their needs easily to care providers, getting the daily assistance they need and giving family members peace of mind. UCare Lingo translates important COVID-19 screening questions, giving care providers the tools needed to assess and act on any risk situation. Everyone in the community can use UCare Lingo to check in on aging seniors. Seniors feel less isolated or lonely when they know their neighbors are looking out for them. Real-time audio translation means care providers can have free-flowing conversations with their patients. Simply tap the microphone icon to chat and instantly brighten someone's day in one of 17 languages. The UCare Lingo app, a faster, simpler, smarter way to communicate. So there's a couple of things I want to point out. We elected to use visual and audio to help reinforce uh, communication. So over and above showing an icon of what the activity is by tapping it, as we heard, it will translate it and say that word in the uh, person's native tongue. Community check-in. At this time of uh, COVID and lockdown, we thought it was very important to share the love. So, and, so this section is very much focused on uh, community volunteers or neighbors. You could very easily pop into your neighbor and ask them a series of questions to find out if they're feeling well, if they need some assistance, do they need some, their help getting their medication or, or some groceries. 
We talked about uh, COVID-19. It's all about limiting the spread. This could be used at any public facility, such as a public <laughs> library, a hospital. It could be used at airports to help screen people so you could actually screen them in their language, as well as taxi drivers when you have people entering their car. But the most important thing when it comes to removing barriers is the active voice-to-voice -voice translation. Now, I am smiling because uh, at the start of it, Nolana said, yeah, she showed a lot of older people how to be able to demo it, you know, connect on the uh, on Zoom with their phone and project the screen. I wasn't able to figure it out, even though I've been in technology for 25 years. So you're gonna have to bear with me. I just wanna take a moment to show you how it will work. <coughs> so you're not gonna see it very well, but the important thing is I want you to hear the audio. <clears throat> so by pressing the character, good morning, how are you feeling today? Buongiorno, come ti senti oggi? Ho oh, sento male. Avevo un ma da loro a mia testa. Oh, I feel bad. I had them in my head. Sorry, that's my poor Italian. So the point here is you could easily communicate between a patient and, and, and tell them what you want or to your neighbor. And in return, they will be able to communicate to you in Italian. And you could just have this ongoing conversation back and forth. Is it, a, is it the best solution in the market? Probably not. There's probably a lot more uh, better translators. And what I mean by better translator is having a human to human that could sit there and be in your pocket. So every time you need to somebody, need to speak to somebody, you take them out. But we do realize and we do recognize that the options right now are either to book a, an affordable translator, which is very expensive, especially if you're at a hospital. And this is where I'm emphasizing. So the easiest thing, and this is why it's the best solution out there, is you have the translator app in your hand. You could either use predefined and pre-recorded uh, flows that we have, activities or COVID or community check-in, or you could use the active voice-to-voice -voice translation to have a free-flowing conversation. At this point, what I'd like to do is turn it over to Dr. Chasen so he can share with you guys our, our amazing virtual care app, and I'll go off video not to distract. Well, thank you very much uh, to everybody for inviting us here tonight. I will say before I speak about the UK Relief app, which I thought was phenomenal when we started using it, is that this UK lingo I can, can personally attest to is very, very helpful. It gives a good number of languages. There's still another good number of them that it needs to uh, put into its repertoire, specifically that I work here in Brampton. So a lot of the South Asian languages, it's not so fluent on. But uh, the European languages, I found it very, very, very helpful. And I, to, to tell you a little bit about the UK Relief app. So if you really look at what our issues are, I'm a palliative care physician and medical oncologist. And we have um, probably 250 new patient consults a, um, a, a month. And we've got um, 11 doctors. We had, there, were, there were 10, but we now have 11 doctors. And there are two clinic nurses, one clerical associate. We're working in the outpatient clinic here just at the Brampton Civic um, of 10 half clinics. That's five full days a week. And we have people working into the community. This is pre-COVID um, that we had uh, doctors going out into the community three to five full days per week uh, in order to see patients. So that's a good number of patients that we've seen at that stage. It was 120 point appointments per month. And it's, as I said, it's now over 200. And uh, we, people are out there in the community and they uh, don't always have nurses that are, are visiting them or that are phoning them. <clears throat> and uh, they patients that really would like to participate in their own care. You know, very often as an oncologist would hand, lift up an X-ray and say, well, Mrs. Jones, your, your lung cancer is getting better. And she'd say, yeah, it may be, doctor, but I'm still very short of breath. And we know today that patient reported outcomes are really the very important way forward. So our pressures, as you can see, are that urgent visits have to be triaged. And that's what we see as urgent, not necessarily what the patient is seen as urgent. The wait times for the consultations really can get quite extensive and what's happening to the patients in between. And because we see a lot of new patients, there's um, who's, who, we have to ask ourselves who's, who's, who has enough symptoms and should be triaged 
um, that we should have that follow up time brought forward. So <clears throat> you can it came along and uh, along with us, we looked at, we did an environmental scan to see were there other e-health um, applications available. And there were very few at that time. We started in May, 2018, and there were very few. As you can see, there were just about 29 articles that came out that we then went in and uh, for, for 10 years looking, using the words mobile apps or mHealth or palliative care. Next slide, please. And in palliative care, all we saw that there were just four studies. Some were using mobile phones, some were using a digital based app, some were looking just at pain and others weren't mentioning any specific symptoms. So we could see that this was a way forward. Please next slide. Knowing of course, that there, was some there were some results coming out that were incredibly significant. And uh, these two are, are and they, they, these have subsequently been um, replicated many times. And that's looking at um, using a web-based application um, compared with standard mo mo uh, modalities where patients were actually reporting their symptoms and uh, on a web-based app. And de depending on what those symptoms were reporting and the reactions and the subsequent treatment were all taken into account. <clears throat> and they saw that this was a variety of cancers, that those patients that were using the web-based application had a, um, a, a, an overall survival of, uh, you know, 22.4 uh, months. And in those patients that were just getting the usual care, it was significantly less at 16.7 months. So at that stage, people were saying, well, what is it? Well, why, why are these patients living longer? Are they reporting their symptoms uh, and, and being treated earlier or being recognized earlier and, uh, and getting the correct treatment earlier? And this was the thought process that if patients could now participate in their own assessment, that, that healthcare providers, the nurses and the doctors we're getting a better idea of where they were in their disease and patients were then part of that partnership. And along came a, a Ethan Bausch, who this was a, a big study presented at the American Society of Clinical Oncology. And he once again reported on patient reported outcomes. That's what is the patient telling you and how are you responding? Doctor, today my pain I feel is a six out of 10. Yesterday, it was a four out of 10. Not that um, eyes of position think, well, you, this guy's got really bad pain. It's a bit worse than it was yesterday, but that you're actually beginning to quantify it according to what the patient is telling you. And here again, they started seeing that there was a statistically significant difference in the overall survival. So patients were living longer if they were using this web-based app. <clears throat> As you can see, the difference on that stage was 5.2 months. Next slide, please. So we um, decided that we were going to do a pilot study. That is, we were going to take about 20 patients in, um, in, in our program. These were outpatient uh, patients in the outpatient setting that were still ambulatory and that were had metastatic cancer and that were experiencing symptoms whether it be the, the 11 common symptoms, pain, nausea, vomiting, tiredness, shortness of breath, anxiety, depression, constipation, those kind of symptoms that people um, with advanced cancer have. And we partnered with UKNET and wrote up a grant that, came, that went to the Center of Aging and he Health Brain Innovation. And they gave us $50,000 in order to design the app and do the particular study. And we wrote up the protocol and presented it to our REB and they approved it uh, at the end of May 2018. Next slide please. And this is kind of what the uh, what the app looks like. This is what the clinician will see. So the patients would have the app downloaded onto their phone or onto the computer. They would <coughs> every day report um, according to the, the symptoms. So I've already told you some of them are on the what we call the ESAS, the Edmonton Symptom Assessment Scale, which looks at those common symptoms. 
And every day they would say, well, today is two out of 10. Tomorrow we'll see maybe it's four out of 10. And depending on how much that, that, uh, that level increased would either then give us a, a green um, alert, a orange alert or a red alert. And every day, so that is what we would see. This is what the clinician would see because all of those came to a, um, a dashboard. Please, next, next slide. And this is what the patient would see. As you can see on that, uh, on that scale, those are the most common uh, symptoms that we see. And the, when the patient would log onto the app, this is what they would see. And then, as I say, this would trigger alert. We, if, if, we, if we got and we saw there was a red alert, somebody would phone the patient. If there was an orange alert, they would probably phone the patient as well. If there was a green alert, nothing would happen. Depending on what that person phoning the patient would, would see, we'd either bring the patient into clinic or we would um, organize a virtual visit. We were doing OTN at that time. Or we, would, we, would, we said if it really gets bad, we'd bring the patients into the hospital. Um, obviously, what we were trying to do is keep patients in their own home because we know that the majority of people do not want to come to a hospital. You know, it, it, it's uh, over 80%, 90% of people would actually prefer to die in the comfort of their own home. But at the moment in Ontario, 50 to 60% of people die in hospital. This was before COVID. They were dying in hospital. So we knew that there was a disconnect somewhere. And this was to, <coughs> as we said originally, to give the, the right treatment to the right patient in the right time by the right person. Next slide, please. And these were our metrics. You see, there were 20 patients recruited. Um, there were five patients that withdrew from the study because some, most of them died. The incidence of non-compliance uh, reported symptoms, uh, we did see there were patients that weren't doing every day. And so what we realized is that we don't have to have it every day. Um, there were patients who called for symptom support, who called for technical uh, support. Those were 133 triggers were, were, were triggered. Um, 60 people got a telephone intervention. Um, five of those people needed a clinic intervention. One person actually, we, we went out and did a home visit. Um, there were people requiring telephone interventions without that trigger being alerted, without that red trigger, but rather a, an orange trigger that was being alerted. And uh, the one person that came to the ED was a person that uh, cared pump stopped working and there was no nurse to go out at two o'clock in the morning. So the patient came to the, to the ED. And we can see that even whilst during that, the, the, the period of the study, there were four patients that actually had a hospital admission um, and two people actually died in, the, in their own home, which is what we wanted to do. And we had one, only one person that died in hospital whilst on this particular study. Next slide, please. So we concluded that there were 80% that were active in their own health monitoring um, and 100% who were compliant and were able to communicate these symptoms. Um, and 80% of patients completed daily the assessment that they should have done. And we showed a statistic that there was definitely a decreased amount of, uh, of hospital admissions. And more important is we saw that really not, over 90% of clinicians reported um, that they were now more confident in, in treating their patients at home. And 92% felt that their, their patients themselves had a better uh, experience because that's what their patients were telling us. And that <coughs> um, this related to, uh, to three quarters of us clinicians really thinking that the quality of life for the patients were better. They were being treated in their own home. They weren't having to phone 911. They weren't having to come to the ER and wait sometimes hours uh, when all it was maybe needed was a dose adjustment. And these are some of the patient testimonials that came out that my pain was really livable because we, we knew that you were there with us, we weren't alone. See, if we understand that majority of patients with palliative care needs never want to feel as if they are helpless, hopeless and abandoned. So to, to, to have hope doesn't necessarily only imply a favorable outcome but it means that you've got a good team with you that will do their best in order to give you the, the best that they can, the best that you can get. So you're not alone, you don't feel abandoned, you're not helpless, 
and you're not hopeless. If you're not helpless, you'll be able to report and somebody's going to listen to what you're reporting. So somebody once said, they said, I'm so thankful that you were here for me as well as for my daughter. Next slide, please. Oh, Next sorry. slide. So I, I, you know, I, I was very grateful that uh, that uh, Nectari and myself met, and that uh, the nurses really helped us put this together, and the physicians as well as the patients. Um, some of them were at 2018. They were a little bit unsure of what the technology and were they going to be able to manage the technology. But uh, due to the in, incredible backup that they had, if something went wrong, they had backup from a technical point of view as well as from a medical point of view. So. I see this the way forward. Um, what, what has happened is that the uh, this particular app got a high impact practice award and um, Health Canada approached us and asked us to write another grant and we've just been awarded that grant to take this particular app to communities that um, that are more on the minority communities like the homeless, as you can imagine this will help a lot to the uh, uh, Francophones that are in Ontario and to the Anglophones that are in Quebec, as well as some of our indigenous populations and French speaking populations um, up north in North Bay and Thunder Bay. So uh, it's, it's, it's certainly take, got the attention from, from government and uh, we certainly are quite excited about moving this forward and how we're going to further develop the app to allow the patients maybe that they, we could do a, a a blood pressure or listen to their heart with a stethoscope or do some, you know, to allow them to, to, to you know, a pulse as well as a oxygen saturation, etc. So uh, it, it, it's the way forward. Technology is certainly helping. Well, the other thing that we could say is that one nurse could probably in the community look after maybe 25, 30 patients and then go and see patient A, B, C and D on, on Monday and, and E, F, G on Tuesday. Whereas now she'll she'll get a, an alert from the app, and will say, well, you you need to go and see patient Z today because that's the patient that needs your help. So, in a way, what we're now seeing is not only equality but it's equity. So the person that needs the most treatment is getting the right treatment at the right time, and the person that doesn't really need to have that visit today because there's somebody else that needs it more, um, will get there will not get it on that day, but will get it as a priority when they need it. So I'm very grateful. I think this is a great idea. And I think uh, specifically now in COVID where patients cannot come in, this is an invaluable tool. So thank you for your attention. Thanks, Dr. Chasen. And I think it's really important to, to emphasize uh, as what Dr. Chasen said, this is an opportunity to build scale within the health system. Because as we heard, one nurse can now monitor many more patients and by triaging them remotely, we have the opportunity to send the right resources in. So this is a really good opportunity for us. And that for us, society. And then second, by building in some of the more advanced bio sensors that Dr. Jason is saying, um, over and above it being a, qual a qualitative analysis of how the patient's feeling, now doctors will also be able to check their blood pressure, listen to their heart rate, check their oxygenization. So this starts moving into much more of a true virtual care uh, platform. So we're really excited about working with Dr. Chasen. His mentorship has been great. He's got a very, very soft, gentle approach, but that gentleness is what's always pushing this, the team and stretching us uh, to make sure we're doing as, as good of a job as we can. So we'll turn it over now to any questions. And if people have any questions for myself or Dr. Chasen, we'd be happy to answer them. So I saw there was one question, is, uh, has this been rolled out? Um, it, no, it hasn't really been rolled out at, 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 at Osla. Because remember, this is really an app that I believe should be in the community. We don't. We need this to be monitored by the nurses in the community and not in a hospital. We did it in a hospital, but it's being taken out into the community. And that's what this whole um, uh, Health Canada grant is about, is taking it out into the community, that the family physicians will be able to monitor their own patients in the community so that they keep them in the community and don't bring them to hospital. So it's, it's really more for nurses and family physicians within the community. And hopefully that uh, this, this, the, the grant will, if, will eventually roll out into this being the standard of care. Thank you so much both uh, to Dr. Chasen and Nick Dari. I think I'm um, speaking on behalf of everyone saying that was a very inspiring 
uh, overview of your amazing work. Uh, we definitely appreciate it. So I am going to open it up to questions. We have some questions in the chat, which I'm going to go through and uh, ask our panelists to uh, kindly respond to. But just as a reminder, please feel free to ask your questions in the Q&A box and also in the chat. I'll be, go, uh, I'll be going through them. And at any point you would like to uh, turn on your mic. We had that before in these sessions. Uh, partnerships have been um, formed during this session. So feel free to raise your hands and uh, I think I'll be, uh, I'll have the functionality to unmute you so we can um, take part in the conversation. So one of the main questions that we were getting um, is about the market plans. So I'm going, I, I think you spoke to that earlier, but I'm going to um, uh, just bring up some of these questions. One was specifically about uh, Nova Scotia and any plans you may have on entering that market or is already uh, accessible by individuals living in Nova Scotia. Yeah, so we did do some uh, tests within the maritime provinces, specifically Nova Scotia and St. John's to see how the recruitment will come along. What we found in the beginning is we focused on families, but we didn't have enough care providers for families to select from, so that didn't go well. So we ran an initial pilot with William Mosler, and that's where I met Dr. Chase, and that was with her chief of uh, research. And a lot of the feedback that came back is we need more choice, we need more supply, so our attention has been on the care providers. Now that we have, I guess, a repeatable model, we are launching our new website or yeah, our new website. It's all meant to make it easier for families to post as well as for care providers. We wanna run that for about another 30 days here in Ontario in a ge geography so we can make sure it's working perfectly and we're addressing the concerns of families. And then by June, we plan to roll out to the families. That doesn't mean care providers cannot start signing up and getting themselves ready for other provinces. Just that from a family perspective, we'll be ready in June. Perfect. And uh, another, I guess, a follow-up question from uh, John, um, who asked how you are recruiting caregivers. Yeah, so primarily through word, word of mouth. We use a lot of different venues. We do educational events. Um, we go to a lot of seminars that, that we speak to. Our word is actually getting around. There's nothing more fulfilling and rewarding as, a, as somebody that, that's trying to start up a company and running it when all of a sudden you introduce yourself from Ukraine and you hear, oh yeah, we heard about that. So I think it is a matter of word of mouth. It's, a, it's a quite a bit about education and, uh, and digital advertising that's helping us to uh, get the recruitment going. Great, thank you. I, I guess uh, a potential here is that John, uh, as he introduced uh, himself kindly in the chat, he is on the board of Community Links um, that ties the community organization and seniors in Nova Scotia. So there, there may be um, some uh, parallels there. Um, I'm going to follow with another question from very, uh, all very good comments. I'll read through them for you. But uh, there was a question from Christine uh, about the, the languages. If you can give us some example of the languages which, uh, that were featured. I think it was previous to where you mentioned the number of the languages, which was very impressive, but uh, so how many um, you have and what are some of the examples of the thinking? Yeah, so I'll just read them off. We have 17 languages. I think we got pretty good coverage uh, if we start from the East. So we have both Mandarin and, Can and Cantonese. We have Hindu. Uh, we got Punjabi right now. We got Urdu. Um, so we got a pretty good representation. We have a lot of the European languages. Uh, if, yeah, and most of them. I'm sorry, we also have Vietnamese, and we have a lot of the European languages as well. So in total, we have 17 languages. Of the 17, only 15 have an AI portion for the voice-to-voice -voice translation right now. So unfortunately, Punjabi is not one where we have automated voice-to-voice -voice translation. Um, and that's really a matter of our partner uh, Google actually making that available. But as we do know, these AIs are coming out very, very rapidly. So it's just a matter of us uh, integrating it. We do two things. One, we hire native speakers and we use them to pre-record all the languages. So now we will be growing our, our language base. And then it's a matter of the technology catching up as well. I do want to emphasize to John, thank you very much from Nova Scotia. We were very happy to release Carolingo last month. And for the first 60 days, we're making it for free. 
So anybody out there, John, you with Community Links, if you think any of your staff or your family could use it, or if anybody works within a care environment, you're a care professional, please download the app. It's going to be for free. And the more people that download it for free, the happier we will be. I think it's a really good app and can provide a lot of value. Um, thank you, Nick Dari. I think Joan also asked for your contact info, so I'll leave it uh, at the end of the session where you can hopefully con uh, exchange contacts um, or information on downloading the app. Uh, there are questions about insurance, and I'm going to ask them uh, together. So one was from Hannah uh, about um, about. So the question is: Does your uh, do your uh, does your caregivers all have insurance coverage? Um, and the uh, the, the, I guess in, in, in that line, uh, Christine also asked that, does any insurance companies cover the cost of the apps currently? Cover the cost of what? Of the apps. Oh, okay, that's an interesting question. Yeah, so let's talk about the insurance and let's talk about what we as a platform enabling technology does. We are not an agency, right? We're not here to replace agencies. We would like to complement them through our technologies. Same thing with the LIN. So it's, it's our job to make it easier for people to procure and find people. We have workflows that are going to be coming out with our new version of our, of our website that makes it very clear to families, right? This is what you should be doing. These are the steps. This is how you should screen them. When you're happy and you're screening them, make, make sure before you let anybody in your house that you do reference checks and you also do background checks. And then we have a partnership with one of Canada's leading background uh, providers. So through the, you know, through the comfort of the care provider's home for $30, they could actually get their background, criminal background check done and their reply back in 24 hours. The same thing with insurance. There are providers that provide insurance. A lot of care providers that are accredited could actually become members of the Ontario Personal, Personal Support Organization. And Miranda and her team actually provide insurance coverage through a broker. So you could either get your, your insurance through an organization like OPSWA. If you were a nurse, you'd get it through nurse or through any other insurance broker. We ourselves do not provide insurance for the individuals. It's our goal just to bring the technology to market so they could use it. Thank you very much, Victoria. And uh, to follow up, um, a, a very nice comment from Christine that uh, she said, it's great what you're doing. And uh, she's asking how she can help to get the message out there. And I, I'm just gonna answer with the one suggestion, um, as Christine kindly noted out, you can share the, the video of this presentation with your uh, network. And uh, I think that'll be a good start, but I, I, uh, I wonder if uh, Nectari has uh, a couple more points on this. No, that would be it. We'd love to work with a lot of people. I think I'm very fortunate. We have a lot of great people working for us and they're all in this business along with me because they want to do, do good and they want to actually give back. So Christine, any ideas you have, you want to come and join us as a volunteer or with the other volunteers we have to get the word out, we'd be more than happy to welcome you. A question from Amy and Amy, please uh, feel free to let me know if you'd like to come out of mute and ask this yourself or any follow-ups. Um, but her question is, uh, can you clarify what criteria your booking app uses to match client and caregivers? So uh, she gave examples. Is it like language, interests, how that matching happens? Yeah, so that's a really good question. I don't want to get into many, many of our details as to how we rank all those things because we've been tweaking it. But yeah, we do start geographic proximity because we do realize from a lot of the care providers that we spoke to, one of their big frustrations in working in home care is having to drive a very long distance or commute very long distances to get to their clients. So we start first from geographic location. We then start to the skill sets and the experience that families are looking for because those are the basics. We look at uh, languages to make sure there's a language fit. We also look at the interest to see if we could find interest. There's a little matrix that happens behind the scenes and that's how we rank the people and bring the, uh, the matches forward. Thank you very much, Victoria. And uh, as said, Amy, if you had follow-up questions, please feel free to. Um, There's one thing I do want to mention. I was quite surprised how many second languages our care providers uh, speak. I was also very surprised to find that there's a lot of fantastic and well-qualified people that are new arrivals in Canada who are either nurses or clinicians back in their country and they're not licensed here. And quite frankly, they want to work in the industry. And the other thing that I found is if you go back to the expert report that was written in 2515 and 
2016 about the home care industry, I was surprised to see that 80% of all the support services are really for traditional homemaking. So, you know, it's, it's tidying up the house, helping prepare dinner, do the groceries, tidy up, you know, help somebody with their, uh, with their hygiene. So as a result, you know, the, the, you know, the, the beautiful person next door, right? Man or woman, your neighbor is somebody that could fulfill this job. And one thing that we're doing to help build scale, especially at this time of the crisis in long-term care, where I think I read a report today, something like 49,000 new care providers or PSWs need to be hired is they should, you know, long-term care is where we need a lot more experience in medical coverage. And that's where the big flow will go. And what, we do, what we're doing is we're helping to build capacity by reaching out to non-accredited companion keepers, if you will, that have many, many years experience either tending to their own children or to their own families, who are sort of big self-interest in getting trained and up, update, uh, updating their skills, who are now coming to market and are available for families. So I think we're doing a good job in that area. Thank you so much, Nick Perry. And uh, a question from Paul, which um, it may be uh, addressed to Dr. Chasen. Uh, so it's about the correlation between the reported symptoms um, and tracking and the delivery of the required interventions. Um, so uh, it, uh, Paul uh, draws upon the, um, the part where you were talking about the significant delay between an event and the ability to get the uh, patient seen by the appropriate specialist. Uh, and the study um, you conducted, um, uh, Paul is asking, how did the time for patient compare to traditional models? Okay, <clears throat> so that's exactly why we did the study. And why, because what would normally happen, a patient would say, start having, and I'm gonna use pain, but it could be nausea, vomiting, anxiety, depression, constipation, shortness of breath and tiredness. Those are the common kind of symptoms. And the patient notices this is getting a bit worse. So they wait and they wait. And by five o'clock in the afternoon, they can't anymore. So then they get in their car or they phone 911 and they go to the ER. Or they try and get hold of their physician. And uh, the physician says, okay, he's not seeing the patient now, but he can't get an appointment. Or the, uh, the receptionist says, I'll tell the physician. So there's a significant wait. Whereas now you've got somebody that's reporting and is actually quantifying how much worse that symptom is getting. And it's been proactively responded to. So instead of somebody's uh, um, pain going from a two to a four today and tomorrow a six, and then them coming to tell the, the doctor, we're picking it up at the four already because that's when the red alert has been sent. And somebody's phoning that person and saying, well, what's the matter? Okay, I think we should titrate your pain medication or you're so nauseous that, you, uh, that you're vomiting every day, the whole time now, or you're not eating. So let's, get, let's change your medication. Let's give you this advice. If it doesn't get better, then we'll respond earlier. So that was the delay. That's, that's why people didn't come to the ER. You see, they never, people only come to the ER if they really have to. Nobody really wants to sit at the ERs. Whereas here, you've got somebody that's, mon it's almost like admitting a patient to their own home. I tend to think of it, that's what we're doing. We're admitting patients to their own home and allowing them to tell us how they are actually feeling. That's I a, hope that answers your question, Paul. Thank you, Dr. Jason. That's a very brilliant way of making things really patient-oriented. Um, a question from Christine. Uh, we are down to our very last question, so I'm gonna make this quick. Um, is about the qualifications uh, that one needs to register as a caregiver. Um, example, do they need schooling in the subject? So how would you go with that? Okay, so again, as I said, we're whole focus on making the uh, technology available. So yes, uh, sorry, let me backtrack. I found some of the better caregivers that I have used and I've heard from families used didn't have formal PSW uh, schooling. So I can't really give a specific answer to that, but we do have an opportunity for the care providers to identify their educational background, upload any certificates they have. Also, we're working and I'm sort of pre-announcing, but we're working with one of the uh, McMaster uh, health groups to actually bring out a series of educational videos that they have created. So these are, you know, doctor-led, doctor-created videos 
that we will make available for them to our care providers. And we're starting off first with a series of videos about how to deal with people with cognitive impairment. So there's always an opportunity to do ongoing training. There's other organizations out there, which I never knew. And I worked as an orderly for a couple of years when I went to college, right? Like, how do you, how do you lift somebody, you know? And the biggest, one of the dangers is you never hold them by the hand because you could dislocate their, their wrists, right? So there's all these little tips and tricks. So um, long story short, we give them the opportunity to upload their educational cert certifications. We were working on developing educational formats uh, or content for them. When I say developing, it's not us developing. I think we're a distributor and that's what we do very, very well. So we're interested in working with all partners out there that have any educational material that we could then bring out to our channel. And that's how we're approaching those two venues. Thank you very much, Nick And uh, on the topic of partnership, uh, a bit different, but a question from Ian, and I would like to uh, read uh, the nice comment from Ian that found this idea brilliant um, and really well done. Uh, uh, plus a question about whether or not the app uh, is available for government funded home care. And I'm gonna ask, uh, just add to my question of, if not, do you see that being in your uh, plans going forward? I, I missed the last part. There was a little breakout in the video, so, if not. So if, if not, uh, I would just, uh, I was wondering about your opinion on the potential of this to be used for government funded home care. Absolutely. So just to answer, so the app is currently available, both CareLingo as well as our UCareNet app. We call it UCare Map because it helps you map out your home care. They're both available on the Apple Store as well as uh, Google Play. The, uh, the app is for a free download, so is CareLingo for right now. These are definitely available for anybody that wants to use it, even for gov uh, government-funded uh, home care. Nothing would make me happier than if the com agency communities out there or the home care organizations actually use the app so they could communicate with their families. This is a big problem. Uh, and it's not just customer service. It's just eliminating the stress and helping somebody keep their finger on the pulse. So we all know that these poor home care workers jump from one person to another. By the time they get back to the office, give an update. By the time that update, which never happens, goes, goes to the family, it's not acceptable today, right? We have better methods of communication. We're not back to 20 or 30 years ago. And I'm saying this respectfully. I'm, 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 I don't mean to criticize. I would love if uh, government-funded uh, home and uh, long-term care centers could actually use our apps either to translate or to use the app to send updates to the families just to give them a higher level of comfort that their loved one is taken care of and they're feeling okay that day. Thank you very much, Nectari, and thanks everyone for their uh, questions. I apologize that we may not get to all of them, but um, uh, right, we're on time. So at this point, I'm going to thank our amazing speakers for introducing us uh, to you, Kernet. Um, and uh, thank our um, uh, thank our participants uh, for being with us. If any final notes, uh, Nectari or Dr. Jason, you would like to add, um, now would be the time. If not, we can wrap up the session. Well, thanks very much for having us. I'll come again if you invite. <laughs> Yeah, we'd love to give you an update. As Dr. Chasen said, he uh, recently got the Health Canada Award, so we're excited about working with him, and that'll start in 22 by the time we recruit. We are doing another community uh, pilot, hopefully in the next 30 days, where we'll take this out to the community. So it's going to be an exciting time. And if anybody has any additional questions or wants to email me, please do. It's nectari at ucarenet. And I'd be more than happy to have an opportunity to meet with all of you people. And if we ever have any partnering opportunities, please let us know. Thank you so much. So with that, I'm gonna ask you to please uh, provide your email or any other means of communication information about the app where it can be downloaded on the chat. It may be easier to access. Um, and I'm going to wrap up the session. Again, thanks to everyone, but I'm going to just, I'm not gonna close uh, the, uh, the chat so that uh, everyone will have the time to copy and have that record um, to be able to reach out to you or download the app or take care in the, take a part in the community outreach you mentioned.